Well, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to uh, one of the uh, Institute uh, lectures that we have. As you, many of you know, this is a, a series of lectures that we have had at NYU Abu Dhabi since before we opened as an institution. And tonight's lecture is associated with an event that's happening at, at NYU Abu Dhabi, which is the um, inaugural opening of the Research Institute. And we're extremely honored to have our speaker, uh, Lee Hood, who's come all the way from Seattle uh, to tell us uh, about systems biology and, and medicine. Uh, to introduce him, so I won't take too long, is going to be one of our faculty, uh, Rich Bonneau. And I'll just say a couple words about Rich. Rich is a computational biologist who's been at NYU for a few years. He's actually a protege of, uh, of Lee Hood's, having spent uh, four years in his lab. And he's got a couple of uh, uh, embarrassing things that I can say about him, but I'll, I'll just keep it short. One of the things I can tell you about Rich is that he was uh, one of 20 people that was uh, nominated or, or highlighted in Discover Magazine as the top 20 scientists top, uh, under 40. Um, and, and that's because he has been pioneering a lot of different approaches for use in computational biology to understand networks and also to understand how protein structures uh, are actually resolved. One of the things I like about science is, in fact, how it can take turns that you don't expect. And in many ways, Rich uh, represents that because I think of ways in which sometimes, uh, as scientists, people want to work from first principles. But then, of course, there are ways that people can have big jumps. And one of the big jumps came uh, when he was a graduate student working on Rosetta, um, uh, is a part of a group of people that, in fact, demonstrated that you can, you can have protein structures resolved uh, much more accurately by not necessarily using all the necessary physics that you have, but some of the physics, and you can jump ahead. So I think what, this is one of the ways in which Rich has always been pioneering uh, different areas, and it's really wonderful to have him here to introduce his former mentor, uh, Lee Hood, so Rich Bono. Before I start, I'll just say Lee is uh, one of the first, one of the only, one of the seven people to be members of all three national academies. He's won numerous prizes and awards. And instead of just listing them all, I wanted to just go through three of, I think, the most important things that Lee's done for the scientific community. Um, so when he was at Johns Hopkins and Caltech, in his early career, uh, he worked on the immune system. And Lee is, has a PhD and an MD. So he's got a PhD from Caltech and an MD uh, from Johns Hopkins. And so when he started, many of them think as, the, as one of the fathers of systems biology and genomics, which is a very technical thing. It's about instruments. It's about data. But the important thing to remember about Lee is that he started thinking about medically relevant topics. So how does the immune system recognize the vast diversity of bacteria and viruses that are constantly evolving much faster than we are. And he was one of the people who co-discovered how antibodies, how their variable domains rearrange. And this involved a, a break from the central dogma because there are cells that depart briefly in your body from evolution. They break up their DNA and recombine it. And so to figure this out uh, wasn't just taking a teeny step but had to, you had to have some faith in that, that you've done things right and that you'd analyze the results, and then you probably had some people tell you that you were crazy. But he turned out to be right in the end, um, which is a theme that we'll develop here. So <clears throat> the, next, the next sort of thing, and that, of course, Lee did many things that I'm you know, not aware of, but that's one major thing. Um, from there, he went on to Caltech. That's where he did his PhD, but then that was where um, he started a lab. Uh, and, and there they actually worked on uh, a great many things. Again, uh, the biology came first, but in order to follow that, the biology, the questions that he wanted to answer, Lee ended up developing several instruments that essentially have revolutionized biology. And so one of them is the DNA sequencer, um, the automated DNA sequencer. And so the, the importance of this machine can hardly be underestimated. It's with, you know, many people say this is what allowed for the human genome, right? But the human genome was you know, th th this allowed for just about everything that, that I took for granted when I did my PhD, right? We had protein structures to predict because we had sequences of genes. Uh, he also worked on instruments that synthesize short proteins called peptides. Um, the peptide synthesizer is also an extremely important tool for biologists and chemists. Um, and he also made contributions to many other 
other instruments, including oligonucleotide synthesis, which without we wouldn't have PCR. So PCR is how we amplify DNA. But to start amplifying DNA, you have to make little bits of DNA to start the reaction. And it would be terrible if we had to cook those up in our lab one base at a time. Okay, so in terms of person hours that, that Lee is now saved, I mean, we're talking billions of people hours, right? And all of those tools uh, essentially led to numerous things, but in, in particular, they led Lee uh, to found the company ABI, which ended up not just making those discoveries, but packaging them in a way that biotechnology could use and take for granted. So now you have DNA sequencing as a module, and you can order it from this company, and it works. And, and the price point was such that it was widely adopted across essentially all biological labs. And so the importance isn't just that he made the discovery and figured out how to make this machine, but that operationally he connected it up through the chain until it was a product that we could all take for granted. And that's when science becomes magic, and that's when we can actually take a discrete step because we don't have to look down. We can step onto the next step. And, and, and so that, the number, uh, so many of his prizes including the Lemelson MIT Prize were based on that. And I forgot to mention the Lasker Award for the previous work in, in immune diversity. Um, but in any case, that, that alone has led to numerous prizes and, and, and essentially is um, uh, one of the main things. But um, after that, after founding approximately 10 companies, um, Lee started to realize, amongst you know, many people, including Lee, realized that now that we have genome sequences, Interpreting these genomes is actually the next challenge, and he co-founded or he founded the Institute for Systems Biology. And systems biology is, is biology, uh, essentially, it's enabled by being able to measure many genes at once, thousands of genes at once. And so what this does is it changes biology from a science where we're looking at the mechanisms of individual things, which we are still doing, but it adds the dimension that now we can think about biology as an integrated system. And so this is a huge leap forward, and again, um, I, oh, I forgot to mention that when, you know, Lee was building these tools for DNA sequencing and saying that genomics is uh, not that it, uh, is the next step, people were telling him that he was crazy and that he's wrong, and it turned out he's, he was right. Um, so then when he founded the Institute for Systems Biology, I think also many people probably told him that he was crazy and this is too ambitious, and, and it turned out that he was right. But at this point, for me, the story becomes a little bit personal because this is when I sort of bumped into Lee. Uh, when I was finishing my PhD. And so at some point uh, near the end of my PhD at the University of Washington, there was this buzz in the air that Lee Hood was leaving, but before he left, he was giving a big talk. And I don't even remember if there were flyers. It was just like everything everybody was talking about for one morning. And the largest auditorium in, in the University of Washington held like 2,000 people. It was this sort of big performance hall, packed, standing, and the fire marshal was called, it was ridiculous. It was like a sellout concert. So we went and we got in there somehow, and Lee gave this amazing talk about what do you need to actually do whole genome, whole organism, holistic biology. And he talked about how we need to actually define the systems, we need to figure out how to fund this, we need to figure out how to get mathematicians and computationalists involved to analyze the data, and then we need to figure out how to, to keep moving the technology to the next level. And all the pieces, essentially seemed like they were just impossible to fit together under, under one roof. And at the very end of the talk, he said, and to do this, I'm starting the Institute for Systems Biology. And a, a year later, after uh, um, a brief experience in biotechnology, I, I joined the ISB. And I have to say that the intellectual environment was unbelievable. Um, essentially, they're, they're the, ec the number of different pieces of expertise under one roof uh, led, it, led Lee to be able to do things like found the company Nanostring, which essentially started off as a bunch of biophysicists and, 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 and molecular biotechnologists who were using double-sided tape to hand make their own microfluidics devices. And now, uh, just five years later, you can order these devices, and I see them mentioned in talks from people all over the place. And so to, and in my own research, it was a similar experience where whether it was computational advisement, proteomics, whether it was the sequencing of genomes, uh, no matter what it was, I had that expertise under, under one roof, and it allowed me to sort of take the random walk I needed to take to, to carry out my research. And I'm one of, you know, many hundreds of people who passed through the ISB. So really, what I really want to do is thank you for giving me that experience, uh, because it was the most, one of the most experience, important experiences in my life as a scientist. Well, Rich, thank you for that, uh, that very gracious uh, introduction.
What I'd like to do is uh, really are three things. One, I'd like to talk in a personal way about how some of the things that Rich talked about actually happened and how my early thinking evolved to where we are today. Uh, then I'd like to show how the paths that we chose have all come together to create something we call systems medicine. And that really is transforming uh, healthcare and how we think about the practice of medicine. And then finally, at the end, I'll talk about the application of systems medicine, something that I call P4 medicine to patients and how we're uh, going about that. But let me begin by saying that if I extrapolate 10 years into the future, I would argue that every single patient will be surrounded by a virtual uh, crowd of billions of data points and we'll have the wherewithal to reduce that enormous data dimensionality to simple hypotheses about health and disease for each individual. And that's the really important thing. The data that we'll generate will be multi-scale. It'll be molecular and cellular and uh, typical medical data. But it will extend all the way up to uh, data of the organs of the individuals and even of the networks of individuals. And I would say that in looking at this enormous amount of data, the overwhelming challenge we're going to have, and it's true of all the big data uh, projects that one, that one knows, is the signal to noise problem. In any large data set, there is enormous noise. And I'll tell you that the noise falls into two categories. There's technical noise and there's biological noise. And the biological noise, I think, can only be extracted away from the signal you need by taking systems approaches. And I'll show you uh, one nice example of how we've done this. Now, you can ask me the question, why do we need billions of data points? And, and the answer is, is really simple. That is, the enormous complexity of biology. And in part, this arises from the random chaotic process of Darwinian evolution. And that process has a tendency to build incredibly complex structures. In fact, structures that are analogous to the so-called Rube Goldberg devices. And here's a device where Rube Goldberg, or the cartoonist anyway, has attached together 14 gadgets that ultimately allow Rube Goldberg to cool this soup. And I think it's interesting to look at this model and say, how might you figure out how this device works? Because the answer to that question is exactly what systems biology is. So the first thing you'd need to know is how many parts are there in this device? You'd need a parts list. The second thing that you'd need to know is how are those parts connected to one another? The third thing you'd need to know is what is the dynamics of this device? And fourth, how, does that, how do those dynamics actually relate to the function of cooling the soup? And if you think about systems biology, it's exactly the same kind of thing. It, early in my career at Caltech, after studying the immune system, it was obvious it contained enormous complexity. And it was obvious many of its most challenging issues could not be attacked one gene or one protein at a time. But at that time, in the 70s and 80s, we just didn't have the tools to do systems biology that came along later. One of the books that I read early in my career at Caltech was this uh, fascinating book by Thomas Kuhn about the structure of uh, scientific revolutions. And it was about paradigm changes and the, and the characteristics of paradigm change. The fact that paradigm changes uh, dramatically reversed how people think about things and the fact that almost all people are enormously conservative and incredibly resistant to paradigm changes. And actually, I had the good fortune in my career to have participated in, in so-called five of these paradigm changes. And I'll uh, briefly mention what they are, because they sum together to bring us to where we are at this point with systems medicine and with P4 medicine. And as you heard from Rich, one of the first was bringing engineering to biology. And 
developing five instruments that led to high throughput biology, and I'll say a bit more about those in just a moment. The second was getting involved at the very beginning, first meeting ever held on the Genome Project, was at Santa Cruz in the spring of 1985, when the chancellor of uh, Santa Cruz had decided he wanted to set up an institute for sequencing the human genome, and he invited 12 experts to assess that, uh, that possibility. And there were two things that were interesting about this meeting. One was we kind of unanimously agreed it was technically possible, but really difficult. And we developed the first uh, prototype sequencer in 85, 86, uh, just about at that time. And the second conclusion we came to was that, uh, that uh, half of us were really for this and the other half were really uh, against that uh, endeavor. The third objective was in the context of making the automated sequencer, we had to bring together uh, a chemist, uh, an engineer, a computer scientist, and a molecular biologist to really figure out the logic and lay out the strategy for doing this. And I realized that biology was going to have to change. It was going to have to become cross-disciplinary because all difficult biological problems have to drive the development of new technologies. And I couldn't persuade the biologists at Caltech this was a good idea, so Bill Gates made it possible to do this at the uh, University of Washington. And in 2000, we created the first uh, Institute for Systems Biology. And then finally, we developed a, we focused systems approaches on disease. And from that emerged P, uh, systems medicine and P4 medicine. But let me just say a, a word or two about each of these uh, technologies. So the five instruments that we developed allowed us to synthesize and sequence DNA and proteins, and, and the last one to uh, synthesize arrays. This is, in fact, the array strategy that uh, Agilent uh, uses. The first four instruments, as you heard, we uh, used to uh, found uh, ABI and get it started as one of the world's first uh, 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 molecular instrumentation companies. What, as I indicated before, th the five instruments uh, allowed us to automate chemistries for synthesis and sequencing, to integrate together different chemistries, and in some case to paralyze and miniature miniaturized chemistries, and of course, that led to high throughput biology. The Human Genome Project, I would say two of its major features from my point of view are one, that it democratized the uh, entire genome. That is, it made every portion of the genome available to any biologist through uh, PCR amplification or the use of other techniques. And two, it created the parts list that was so fundamental uh, to doing systems biology. Uh, I remember when Nicholas Wade wrote an article in the New York Times on how the Genome Project had fundamentally failed and disappointed everybody. And I sat down then and I wrote out the following list of reasons why the Genome Project had been successful. And I don't really plan to go through all of these here now, but it it created the parts list, it, it democratized DNA, it led to high throughput biology, it enabled mass spec based uh, proteomics and so forth, and it transformed biology because it was the first discipline that brought computer scientists and, and applied mathematicians into biology with something to do when they actually ended up staying there. It, it created the attitude of open software and, and uh, open data, and it really stressed the importance of data validation, a lesson I'm afraid we've forgotten in many of the other omics, or at least we have not done uh, very effectively. And it opened up a bunch of fields. It allowed us to do any kind of genome, and on and on, it transformed medicine, it transformed uh, evolution. It, it really articulated this ongoing debate between big science and small science, and if we have time at the end, we'll talk a little bit about that. But, you know, this Battelle instrument uh, assessment that was made recently, that for an investment of $3.5 billion, 
you got back $800 uh, uh, billion dollar return. That's an incredible uh, RI. So, and I would argue that there are other things out there that are going to have similar kinds of returns if in our society we get the money to invest in these different areas. So at the University of Washington in the Department of Molecular Biotechnology, we brought together uh, biologists and chemists and, and computer scientists and engineers and mathematicians and physicians and physicists. Uh, and I think we're incredibly successful in a number of ways. We pioneered the first two major techniques of proteomics. Uh, Phil Green generated the software bo for both assembly and validation of human genome sequences. Um, we developed uh, a very high-speed, Garifontin Inc. developed a very high-speed multi-parameter cell sorter. And it was at the University of Washington we actually developed this inkjet technology that Agilent now uses today. And we actually were home of two of the 16 sequencing centers for interesting sociologic reasons. And it provided the framework for starting the institute. And we started the institute basically because I realized that to create an institute of systems biology, it was impossible to do in a state university that had bureaucracies that were honed by the past and had very fixed ways in thinking about what was acceptable in science. And for that reason, we started the institute and uh, uh, with its holistic and uh, comprehensive experimental approaches. And a critical part of it was already having created this uh, cross-disciplinary platform, which I'm going to talk about. So today, the institute has about 230 people. And we have uh, 10 faculty. And I'll say that there are two really fundamental themes that lie at the very core of what is essential in the institute. So the first is this idea that biology and medicine are really informational sciences. And obviously, that has many different dimensions. But let me, let me mention just a few. If you ask, what are the fundamental types of uh, information in biology? There are really two. One is the digital information contained in the genome. And the second is the environmental information that comes uh, from outside the genome. And if you act, ask what connects, then, these types of information to the phenotype of the organism, the appearance of the organism, again, I would say there are two critical informational structures that actually do that. The first are the biological networks that uh, gather and transmit and integrate and modulate and finally pass off uh, information to simple and complex molecular machines. Both of those entities are dynamical, and the dynamics of both lie at the heart of really understanding how complex systems operate. And in fact, they are very much a central focus for systems biology. But there is yet another dimension of biological information, and that's the realization that it is a hierarchy of uh, DNA to RNA to proteins to interactions to networks to cells all the way up to ecology. And what's really critical is the environment impinges upon each of those levels of information and modifies the core digital signal. So if you're to ever understand a system, you have to, A, capture the various levels of information and integrate them together in such a way that you uh, explicate the nature of the environmental signals that have been contributed. Because to understand a system, you need to understand both its digital core coding information and uh, the environmental contributions. And of course, from that point of view, then, the es essentials of understanding the system become one, let's take the system you're interested in. Let's uh, learn everything we can about it, and then formulate a model that explains that system, and then formulate hypotheses to test the model and perturb the system to test those hypotheses, and to do so in an iterative fashion so that you bring gradually the data into apposition with the uh, theory. And that creates. <coughs> 
uh, a powerful strategy both that is hypothesis driven and hypothesis uh, generating. The second thing about systems biology that's critical is viewing the information. You want to uh, generate as global and comprehensive an informational view of the system as possible. It's possible to do it with uh, genomics, more difficult to do it with proteomics and metabolomics, though all of these things are changing. What's really critical in systems biology, as I've innovated, is understanding the dynamics, both temporal and spatial, of systems, because it is those dynamics that are one of the critical features for dealing with signal-to-noise issues. And third, I've talked about the need to integrate information. And I've already alluded to the fact that there are enormous signal-to-noise problems. And there's biological noise, and there's uh, technical noise. And I'll talk more about those in just a moment. But the ultimate, of course, is to take these data and to integrate them together to create models that are both predictive and actionable. And the models can be descriptive, graphical, or mathematical, depending on uh, the amount of information you have. There is an arrogance in many uh, institutes for systems biology that says, it isn't a real model unless it's mathematical. And I'll say that's utter nonsense. You can get enormous amounts of information uh, from descriptive, and especially, especially from graphical models, uh, as I'll show you in just a moment. What, of course, are the implications of gathering many different types of data is that they represent what I call uh, the network of networks that in the living cell, the living organism, is a seamlessly integrated set of networks that are encoded by uh, DNA and proteins and metabolites and cells and organs uh, all the way up to the social networks. And of course, any disease perturbation within the network of networks reflects outward in an outward manner. And in order to really understand the disease and take corrective measures, you have to be able to identify the disease perturbed network of networks and the consequences that it's caused. So um, the second fact that I would say is really, so that's, that's dealing with biology as an information science. The, the second core idea is this idea of creating a platform that's cross-disciplinary and systems driven and generates both uh, discovery and innovation. And the idea here is really uh, the mantra that's at the very core for us of systems biology. It's the idea that difficult biology always mandates the development of new technologies. And they, in turn, their data, in turn, require the development of new an analytic tools. And together, these things can really revolutionize biology if done in a seamless manner. Now, to be able to do that, you need to superimpose this mantra on top of a cross-disciplinary environment that has all of the scientists you see on the lower right-hand corner there. But those scientists need to be able to do two things. One is speak the language of the other disciplines so you can communicate effectively. And the second is to be able to work together in teams effectively. And I'll tell you, that cultural part of this uh, this uh, platform is perhaps the most difficult to achieve. Uh, and it's taken us, I think, 12 years to be in a wonderful position in that regard. But the point I would make is that this uh, holy trinity, uh, what we call it, not only generates uh, discovery, but it is enormously effective in generating uh, and innovating the opportunities for example, for creating new companies. Because at each turn of the cycle, you generate intellectual property, which is itself potentially the source of new companies. And in fact, to give you some idea of, in the 12 years ISB has been in existence, how effectively we've done things, uh, ISB itself has spun out five companies. All of them are doing very well. Uh, and uh, some have already brought back a lot of money to ISB. But one of the companies we created was an accelerator 
a partnership with five, six venture capital groups that essentially funds very early science and if successful, uh, converts it into companies. And with the accelerator, we've created uh, 12 additional companies. So in a period of 12 years, ISB has been involved in creating 17 companies. We've raised now almost half a billion dollars in venture capital dollars uh, and created almost uh, 400 jobs. So this is, these are the kinds of opportunities that can come from systems biology if you do it right. So uh, the future for ISB then is on the one hand about the technical things, system science, about developing technologies and analytic tools, but it's also uh, about creating this uh, cross-disciplinary systems-driven platform. And it's about two other things I'm not really going to say much about. One is transferring knowledge to society. And we do that in three major ways now. We have seven full-time people for K through 12 science education that really have revolutionized uh, science education in the Seattle School District over the past uh, 10 years or so. Uh, number two, we've started lots of companies, as you've already heard. And number three, we've started a nonprofit institute called the P4 Medicine Institute, which is helping us uh, bring P4 medicine to patients, and I'll speak more about that later. And the final point is we feel strategic partnerships are really going to be the future of the world, and I think share with you very much the idea that global, that international strategic partnerships afford really unique opportunities, not only to bring together a complementarity of skill and expertise, but fundraising and opening up fascinating new kinds of problems. So uh, metrics for success before I get into the science. Uh, I, I would give you three. One, in 2010, there was a Nash, US National Academy of Science report on the new biology, which perfectly described systems biology. And it basically said it was uh, the future. And what I loved about that report is its chair was a friend of mine who, in 2000, said systems biology is hype, and it'll be, never, ever be anything but hype. And it's good to see good people can change their mind when uh, given appropriate evidence. So I think this is testimony to the power of systems biology. The second thing is we've published now about 1,100 papers. And I don't know how many of you know about it, but there is a Spanish institute called SCUMIGO that has developed new criteria for assessing uh, the impact of papers. And in fact, it's got two really interesting criteria. I won't go through all the details. I'd be glad to talk with anyone that's interested. They've assessed this year, in 2012, uh, 3,290 institutes, all different disciplines and so forth. And what we've done in this graph is taken the top 75 of those institutes by their own criteria, and we've ranked them according to the two impact metrics. And I think what's interesting to point out is ISB, as small and as new as we are, uh, ranks uh, third uh, in the world uh, by these criteria in the impact of its papers. And I was speaking with some of you yesterday. Uh, I could find out where NYU is on this graph. I don't know, but I think it would be interesting to uh, to determine it. So I think ISB has done uh, extremely well. So let's move into and talk about systems medicine. And what I'm going to do is, so you've got to really pay attention to the next slide, OK? What I'm going to do is run through and give you each of the areas where I think systems medicine has already begun to have a big impact. And then I'm going to go and discuss three of these uh, in considerable uh, detail. So number one, these dynamical studies of systems have given us the ability to understand in fundamental new ways the pathophysiology of several of the diseases we've studied taking these new approaches. That's important because it gives you new insights 
into thinking about diagnostics and therapeutics. And I'll give you a nice example of just where we've done this. Number two, we've really pioneered this idea of family genome sequencing, that is, the integration of genetics with genomics. And we've demonstrated it's an incredibly powerful tool in identifying genes that cause simple Mendelian traits if you have good phenotypic assays. And in fact, recently we've demonstrated we can use this to identify modifier genes for more complex genetic traits. And I'll mention both of those in just a few moments. Number three, I think we've really made blood uh, a window into health and disease. And we've demonstrated that these diagnostic markers are going to be good not only for disease diagnostics, but for disease uh, or drug toxicity, and even probably assessing wellness. And I'll talk about uh, more about disease diagnostics than the other. Number three, we have powerful strategies for beginning to stratify disease into their discrete subtypes. Any given uh, phenotypically described disease, breast cancer, isn't one disease. It's uh, four or five or more diseases. And it's critical that we stratify those diseases so we can get a proper impedance match against drugs. Number five, we're thinking about how to stratify patients in really interesting ways. And I'll mention more about that in a few moments. And six, we've really got some absolutely fascinating uh, approaches to analyzing how multiple organs respond to a given disease type that let you begin really unraveling the complexity of disease at the higher levels of networks that are operating uh, within a living organism. We have really fascinating new approaches to drug target discovery, and I'll describe more about those in a few moments. And finally, we're increasingly getting interested in wellness, and I'm not going to talk about that because we're really just getting started, and I think I already have uh, plenty to talk about. So let me talk about, uh, in some detail, the first three of those things, and then I'll mention how we're thinking about the last, uh, last four uh, of those points. So a systems approach to disease-perturbed networks in mice. We've studied for the last uh, seven years a wonderful disease where you take um, disease prion particles and inject them into the brains of mice, and you induce, induce a neuropathologic disease that in typical C57 black mouse has a, a course uh, of about 22 weeks or so. And one of the things we've done is to then analyze the information of the brain in the diseased animals and the normal controls, the transcriptomes, and subtract one from another at 10 different time points across the progression of the disease to find the genes that are differentially expressed. And when we did this, to our horror, we found that about a third of the mouse genes were differentially expressed in the mouse brain. So the signal to noise is enormous here. What we did, well, let me again say there, there are, again, two types of noise. One is technical noise that comes from making the measurements. That we can deal with in a variety of ways. But the biological noise is much more challenging. And that comes as a consequence of when you measure a phenotype like the brain transcriptome, there are many biologies that feed into that and some to, to give you that transcriptome. And the question is, how do we subtract away the irrelevant biologies and leave the uh, one biology, that is, the genes that encode neurodegeneration, uh, a center of focus? And what we did, without going into detail, was construct eight inbred strain, prion strains of mice, each carefully designated to be able to subtract away different types of biological noise. And in the end, we ended up with 300 genes uh, probably encoding uh, the, uh, the neurodegenerative response. And what we did then, uh, or what the neuropathologist in our group did, uh, after he'd spent many years doing serial histopathology of prion-induced neurodegeneration in mice, was identified four 
major phenomena, prion replication and accumulation, microglial activation, immune response, and two forms of degeneration. And we took the protein interaction networks for each and mapped those 300 genes into each of those. And what we were able to do then is have a dynamic snapshot of those four major uh, networks. But what was interesting is only 200 of the 300 genes mapped into the four major networks. The remaining 100 defined six smaller networks that heretofore had not been uh, known to be a part of this disease process. And collectively, the dynamics of those networks explain virtually every aspect of the pathophysiology of the disease. What you cannot get are the events that initiate the disease because at the beginning, the signal to noise is very low. So we've used uh, uh, neurospheres infected with prions to get the early events, and that's uh, working beautifully. But uh, so we were able to explain, as my neuropathologist friend said, virtually every aspect about the neuropathology of the, the, uh, the uh, disease. What was uh, equally interesting was that the four major networks became disease perturbed in a sequential manner. As is true of any disease process, there is an ever widening array of networks that become recruited in the disease process. And what is interesting is that if you want to think about dealing effectively with prion disease, you ought to focus your efforts on the most proximal networks because if we could, for example, devise drugs that re-engineered those early disease perturbed networks back to normalcy, you might be able to abrogate all of the downstream effects. And I'll say a little bit more about that later on. What we also could do was make uh, gene regulatory networks and identify the key transcription factors that are uh, regulating these processes. And those opened up a whole series of additional insights into what the disease process is all about. And again, I don't really have time to talk about those. One of the transformational technologies in biology in the next 10 years is going to be single cell analysis, something we started thinking about uh, five years ago. And one of the most important questions that comes from single cell analysis are quantized cell state. So let me define what I mean by a quantized cell state. About a year ago, we took a human glioblastoma cell line and we analyzed at the single cell state uh, 32 cells and looked at uh, 24 carefully selected transcripts. And we were able to demonstrate that those 32 cells fell into three discrete quantized cell types with a couple of outliers. Now, and, and the separation of the quantized cell types was done by analyzing the transcripts that varied in the three quantized cell types from one another uh, in multidimensional analyses. And of course, there are really interesting questions here. What do these different populations do? Do they interact with one another? We're separating these things and beginning to look at all of those kind of questions. But what I will tell you is I think in every normal organ and in every normal developmental process, you will have discrete quantized cell states that are interacting with one another to carry out the biology and or the development. And in this regard, uh, I'm going to tell you about something we're just getting started on to give you an idea of how powerful I think this whole way of thinking is going to be. And of course, that's the really fascinating question of using iPS cells to study the developmental process in a way it could never be studied before. Because in normal development, you can't disambiguate the development of a particular system from all of the other biology that's going on in the living organism. So we're collaborating with a company called Cellular Dynamics, which has applied high throughput biology to one the ability to uh, generate iPS cells from individuals from a few mils of blood. 
to the ability to expand those iPS cells up to billions of cells, and three, the ability to differentiate a billion cells in sync over about a 30-day period to generate four or five different major differentiated cell types. And I'll talk about one, cardiomyocytes. They get cardiomyocytes that are 99% pure at the end that are electrophysiologically and pharmacologically identical to their normal counterparts and that have the three classes of normal uh, cardiomyocytes seen in the heart. So what we plan to do in thinking about quantized states, in order to identify quantized states, you have to ask yourself, what are the molecules that specify different states? And there are three classes of molecules, and clearly, probably the most important one are transcription factors. So we looked at transcription factors in the developmental process of cardiomyocytes uh, in, in the literature, and then more recently in, in this IPS differentiation process. And you can clearly see that there are discrete sets of transcription factors that come up early, middle, and late during this process and argue, I think, quite compellingly for quantized cell state. So what we plan to do then is to analyze in detail, and we're almost done with this, at the single cell level, the initial iPS cells and the fully differentiated cardiomyocytes. And then we want to look at six to eight time points along the 30-day period of development plus selection. And we're going to do single cell analysis at those time points, identify the quantized cell populations, sort them by cell sorting, because some of the molecules we'll be looking at will be uh, CD molecule cell surface molecules, and then, because we're starting with such large numbers of cells, we'll be able to carry out virtually all of the omics analyses on the quantized cell states. Complete uh, uh, genomic analyses and selected uh, proteomic and uh, lipidomic metabolic uh, uh, analyses. And it will generate an enormous amount of data that I think will give us predictive models for development. We want to do this for normal uh, uh, cardiomyocytes or, or iPS cells from normal individuals, but we've also studied by family genome sequencing a family that has a mutation in a transcription factor that generates cardiomyopathies. And we've sequenced most of the members of this five-generation family. And we're going to look at development uh, among one normal SIB, it's in the lower uh, right-hand corner here, the one normal SIB and two other males that have two different forms of cardiomyopathy to see how a disease gene actually perturbs the developmental process in detailed molecular terms with regard to uh, the so-called network of networks. So anyway, let me tell you a little bit then about uh, family genome sequencing and its power. Uh, we published in a science paper in uh, 2010 our first family genome sequencing uh, studies, uh, a family where the parents were normal, the kids each had two different genetic diseases, and it was here we realized what the integration of genomics and genetics could do. We could correct 70% of the sequencing errors, we could identify rare variants and distinguish them from sequencing errors, two or more members of the family had the rare variant. We could actually determine the haplotypes of all the members of the family, and that is critical for reducing the dimensionality of chromosomal search space within which disease genes reside independent of how those disease genes operate. So we have one family now where we've reduced the search space to a tenth of a percent of the genome. So you can actually look through that part of the genome and make educated guesses as to what the disease gene is. We determined that the kids each differed by 35 mutations from their parents. So it's interesting because there's no such thing as identical twins. And finally, we were able to reduce the uh, disease gene candidate list to four, and those were easily identifiable. 
But the other thing we did was we've now developed incredibly integrated, powerful pipeline of software for taking advantage of all the information that comes from family genome sequencing. And I'm not going to go through all the details, but if anyone is interested, this really has the ability, I think, to transform how we do human genetics. And I think uh, in the Middle East, where there are inbred populations susceptible uh, to genetic defects, this, this approach is absolutely made to order. And so we can focus then all of these integrated software tools on uh, the family genome sequences. We've done 700 family genome sequences. Complete genomics is, uh, has been the source of all our genome sequencing. And more recently, we started uh, a new project on preterm birth, which I'm not going to describe, but it has brought us in uh, 1,300 additional complete genome sequences. And I will say we really have some spectacular results on preterm birth from these, uh, these family studies, which it's too early to say very much about. What, the, uh, what these uh, 2,000 genomes have given us are enormously deep insights. And these are 2,000 genomes where the data are really good. This isn't 1,000 thousand, uh, 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 X genome sequences that have been done at a 6X level. This is, these have been done at 60 to 70 to 80 fold coverage. So you've got enormous accuracy. So there are personal recombinational hotspots in different families. Really an interesting observation. There are segments that are very commonly mutated in the population. And in fact, there are 30,000 or so of these segments, which we've now identified. And they're critical in screening for disease genes so you can get rid of things that will not, uh, not so confuse you. There are enormous genomic compressions in the classic prototype sequence at Santa Cruz. And that's where repeat sequences have been placed on top of one another. And of course, if there's a variant in those two repeat sequences, then they appear to be heterozygotes, right? And in fact, what we've been able to demonstrate in the 1000 Genomes Project is there are 20,000 sites that are heterozygous in essentially all the individuals. So there are 20,000 sites of compression. So we've mapped all the compressions, and we can disambiguate those and deal with this excess of heterozygosity. And again, to give you an idea of how powerful family genome sequencing is, here are three different families, four different, five different families we've looked at in the context of a single disease. And with family genome sequencing, we've been able, for this family, and actually a bunch of singletons that we've looked at, been able to identify one gene, and for the other four families, uh, three additional genes. And it's a relatively straightforward uh, kind of process these days to, to move forward. We've also um, looked at 10 humans that have had e three or four successive glioblastomas. And these give us incredibly powerful tools for looking at the whole neoplastic process, comparing the genome sequences of each of the tumors with the wild type sequence for each of the 10 individuals. And what it's going to allow us to do is develop techniques for distinguishing the mutations that drive the neoplastic process from the many, many passenger uh, irrelevant mutations that occur alongside. And the fundamental new insight that has come from just studying in detail the first four genomes is there appear to be two types of variation in cancer. The dominant one is a variation where most of the variants are either single nucleotide variants or single nucleotide deletions. But one of the four had variants that were structural variants that were really striking uh, in nature. And again, you need this very accurate sequence to be able to, to see all of these things. So we're using this not only to look at diseases, uh, but to look at wellness and to look at aging and to look at a variety of other types of things. And again, I, I would argue 
the Middle East is a really ideal place to set this up on a large scale. I'll close by saying I'd argue in 10 years we'll all probably have our genomes done. And of course, you know there's a lot of debate about this, an enormous number of critics about whether this is a good idea. And I'll tell you, uh, the family genome sequencing, I think, is going to be one of the drivers because we'll be able to identify not only potential disease genes, and in some case do something about them, but we'll be able to look at what I call actionable variants. We've identified about 300 of these, and a really beautiful example is a friend of mine from Microsoft who in his late 30s started getting really severe osteoporosis. Went and had a 25 gene SNP analysis done and luckily found that one of his calcium transporters was totally defective. And what he was able to do is uh, take 20 times the normal amount of calcium and in a year and a half he'd reverted his uh, osteoporosis phenotype to a normal phenotype. And there are a whole series of actionable variants. And who wouldn't want to know if you had an actionable variant and then do something about changing your, uh, optimizing your wellness. And what's interesting about this argument is more and more of these actionable genes are being identified as we speak. So once your genome is done, it'll be checked at least every year against the new actionable variants uh, to again to make an investment in optimizing your wellness over your lifetime. And of course, the third generation sequencing technologies uh, nanopore, nanochannel, single molecule analysis, electronic uh, 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 recording of uh, signals and so forth, are going to generate uh, a sequencing that I think in a five to eight year period we'll be able to do a complete human genome and sequence in 15 minutes and do it for maybe $500 a genome. So it's going to make genome sequencing exactly like many routine medical tests. So the objection of cost, at least in the developed world, uh, I think will be significantly less. So let's turn to this third area about blood being a window into health and disease and systems diagnostics. And I'll just preface this by saying, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in the last um, five years we've spent billions of dollars trying to identify relevant biomarkers in the blood. And all of that money has been wasted to a first approximation. And that's really for very simple reasons. The approach almost always is, let's look at normal bloods and let's look at diseased bloods and let's see what differs. And the fact is, a lot differs. And the fact is, 99% of that that differs is noise. So we can use systems approaches to sort out signal from noise. And that's the key to how we've moved forward. And of course, blood is an ideal uh, vehicle because it bathes all organs. And they dump into the blood uh, molecules that are uh, status reporters for that particular organ. And we're going to talk about two molecules in particular. One are organ-specific blood transcripts, uh, blood proteins. These are proteins that are synthesized primarily in one organ that are secreted in the blood. And the change in their levels will be indicative about the changes in the behavior of their cognate biological networks, i.e., when they become disease perturbed. The second biomolecule we'll talk about are microRNAs. They turn out to be, one, very stable in the blood and incredibly uh, powerful uh, blood diagnostics. So uh, the system's approach to blood uh, argues, as I have, that blood is a key diagnostic tool. It argues that these blood diagnostics should be done in a longitudinal fashion. In fact, I see in the future it being done a couple of times a year uh, to be able to follow a lot of parameters we'll talk about in just a moment. And what's critical about longitudinal information is the individual himself is the control against which any change, that is any transition from wellness to disease, has to be judged. Number three, uh, the diagnostics have to be multi-parameter. We want to be able to assess multiple biological networks. Uh, and number four, we're setting up panels now that are mixed 
molecule in nature, and they give you, because of the independence of the types of molecules, higher sensitivity and specificity. And I'll show you a great example of this with uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome in just a moment. We think white blood cells are really going to be a key diagnostic, and I won't say any more about that. And we're now working on strategies to be able to identify blood panels that can identify all the major diseases in a given organ. Again, I can talk about strategies for doing that. And what I'd like to say is we can use these systems approaches to validate the power of many different types of uh, blood biomarkers. But let me talk about uh, organ-specific blood proteins, and let me talk about uh, microRNAs. So we've now identified uh, maybe of the order of 300 brain-specific transcripts, and we've been able to demonstrate about 100 of those can be detected in the blood with uh, uh, targeted uh, mass spectrometry. And what's wonderful about the, the proteins we can detect in the blood is they map back to many of the major biological functions of the brain. So not only are the organ-specific blood proteins indicators of a change in state in the brain, they indicate something about the change in a particular biological function, a cognate biological function. And we've done this for both uh, human and for mice. And in fact, recently, uh, we've been able to um, demonstrate in prion disease where we've identified 15 brain-specific proteins that mapped evenly into each of those four major networks that just from the blood we can, one, do very early diagnosis of prion disease. We can do it about 10 weeks before there's any onset of any clinical signs whatsoever. Number two, we can actually follow the successive progression of disease perturbation of each of the four networks from the blood. So we can not only follow the progression of the disease, but we have inferences about the nature of the biological networks that have been modified in the disease. And I'll just say that we've also analyzed microRNAs there, and they work beautifully as diagnostics. I won't show you the, the data. But this gives us the ability for early detection for disease stratification. I haven't shown you that, but we've done that for ne several neurodegenerative diseases. We can follow disease progression, and we will be able to, we haven't done it yet, follow the response to therapy and assess uh, reoccurrences. We started about three years ago a company called Integrated Diagnostics that is using these same strategies and it's had really spectacular success and will have its first panel for lung cancer out in the first quarter of next year, hopefully. But let me take a couple of moments and talk about some of the more recent studies we've done on post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, I'll point out that this is a disorder that's found in 1.3% of the normal population, twice as common in women as in men. And I'll point out that if you look at PTSD in combat troops that have returned from Afghanistan and Iraq, there's an enormous variance in estimates of how many, what fraction of the soldiers have PTSD. And that's because the psychological criteria for assessing whether you have this disease uh, are A, not agreed upon among the experts, and B, are applied in very different ways. So the idea of getting a quantitative blood study that could analyze PTSD is really attractive. So without going into a lot of detail, we did the discovery phase of biomarker study, looking at 50 soldiers with PTSD of a very severe type and 50 soldiers, normal controls. Uh, all of them were from uh, returned from Afghanistan. And we were beautifully able to put together a multi-omic blood marker panel for PTSD. And this panel had one interesting protein, and it had 11 interesting microRNAs. And to show you, again, the power of organ-specific blood proteins, this protein is uniquely specific for the amygdala uh, 
of the brain, and this is one of the three major areas in the brain that are affected by PTSD. So it maps beautifully right into the biology of the disease. But the really important point is the incredible sensitivity and specificity of this mixed panel. <coughs> it's close to 95% for the two. And again, we have to do a validation study, which we're getting set up to do with 750 soldiers uh, that have P PTSD matched against their normal controls. But if this holds up, it'll be an incredibly powerful marker. Now, one point that you might make is, gee, isn't it really inconvenient to have, to be able to measure from the blood microRNAs and proteins? So we've actually taken the instrument that Rich actually mentioned, the end counter from nanostring, and we've adapted it to doing ELISA assays absolutely beautifully. So what that means is from five lambda sera, we can beautifully measure both the microRNAs and the proteins that are relevant to this uh, bioassay. And it's a simple instrument to use, and I think it could be, in the future, a really powerful tool for diagnostic assays. What I'm really excited about is uh, we're now studying uh, 50 soldiers plus controls that have um, uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, the other major brain disease that comes out of the war. <coughs> and I'll almost guarantee this approach will work there, and the extent to which the diagnostics will be overlapping, I think, will be incredibly fascinating. But what I'm really excited about is that I think we'll be able to extend this to other neuropsychological diseases like uh, schizophrenia and bipolar disease and autism. And I think we'll be able to do all the things we talked about before, early diagnosis, follow progression, and stratification of these diseases. <coughs> and of course, if we can do that, that really will be um, very transformational. So stratification of diseases into different subtypes. Uh, as you all know, uh, you know, 60 years ago, if you got a cancer in the blood, that was one disease. And more recently, it's been five diseases, and then uh, 10 diseases, and now it's about 100 diseases. And the important match is any phenotypic disease can almost always be broken down into discrete subtypes that reflect differing combinations of disease-perturbed networks. <coughs> and the importance of that, of course, is to be able to match the subtype against an appropriate therapeutic uh, um, target and everything. So. Um, we're now uh, taking three different approaches to stratification of disease. One is getting patient iPS cells, say for a neurologic disease, differentiating the patient's neurons in a test tube, and then using environmental stimuli to say in a family uh, that has Alzheimer's, which neurons behave in a particular way to a set of environmental stimuli as opposed to comparison with other Alzheimer's families. And again, if you've got different combinations of disease-perturbed networks, you'll get unique signatures to environmental uh, stimuli. We can use uh, dynamic networks in disease tissues. I've showed you some examples of that. And we can employ the organ-specific blood proteins to uh, stratify disease. So I think we've got some really powerful approaches to disease stratification. We all know that patients have to be stratified too. For example, there are now close to 60 genes that modify patients' responses to drugs. And knowing the pharmacogenomics of the individual patient, I think, is really going to be critical for treatment in the future. But you know, there are uh, genetically determined responses to environmental stimuli, infections. and. <coughs> There are certainly distinct responses to major classes of disease genes. In Huntington's, for example, some patients have uh, early onset at 25 years. Others have late onset at 70 years. And knowing which you are and what the modifiers are that give you late response, quite obviously, are really key. So we'll be stratifying patients into related groups for therapies and so forth. 
We can use organ-specific blood proteins to look at, we've done a recent study in liver toxicity looking at eight different organs to see how they responded to this toxic response, and the data on that are absolutely beautiful. And then finally, learning how to re-engineer disease-perturbed networks to normalcy is really a tough problem, and we're focusing now in microbes where we have enormous control and learning how to re-engineer biological networks. And once we learn how to do that with drugs, then we'll transfer that knowledge to higher organisms. And uh, I think this is going to be our major approach to transforming uh, the problem of the costliness of drugs together with, with disease stratification. Because if we can identify targets effectively, what drug companies are great at is making drugs, what they're terrible at is identifying drug targets. So we can use systems biology to identify drug targets we really can move the agenda forward in a very powerful way. So let me talk finally about P4 medicine because it's really the convergence of systems medicine, and that's what I've talked about up till now, with patient-activated social networks and the big data revolution. And I've talked about the big data revolution and how we're beginning to handle that. But I think the idea of patient-driven social networks is is uh, really important. And in fact, let me talk briefly about the four Ps in the context of what we might expect in 10 years. So on the first predictive, you'll have your genomes done from that. We'll gain an enormous amount of information on optimizing wellness and minimizing your approach to disease. I think in 10 years, we'll have simple handheld devices <coughs> that can prick your finger and take a droplet of blood, and we'll measure 2,500 uh, organ-specific proteins, 50 organ-specific proteins from each of your 50 major organs, and we'll do it in a longitudinal manner. So over your lifetime, we can immediately assess any transition in those organs from wellness uh, into disease and act uh, uh, in a preventive type of manner. On the second P, prevention, the new strategy for drug target discovery is going to be obviously effective in creating drugs. And the point I'd make here is, in the future, there'll almost be no disease that's treated with one drug. You're going to treat diseases with multiple drugs because you can't perturb networks with a single uh, perturbant. And how to learn the rules of doing that, of course, is going to be fascinating. I would say we'll learn how to optimize the cellular immune responses so we can make vaccines with effective cellular immune responses. And these are what's critical to AIDS. And I remember arguing 10 years ago with Tony Fauci that they were really wasting their money putting these billions of dollars into companies to try and generate AIDS vaccines without fundamentally understanding how you uh, can manipulate cellular as opposed to humoral immunity. And, they finally agree. There, there are RFAs out in the last year that are really looking for exactly this. Too bad we couldn't have taken those billions and put it into systems approach to immunity. Uh, but the key point of prevention is an increasing focus on wellness in the future. And I'll say more about that in just a moment. The personalized side of things, we differ from one another on average by uh, 6 million nucleotides. We are each unique. We have to be the control for uh, assessing our own data. And the participatory is, of course, the, the really challenging P. Um, Patient-activated social networks actually, I think, are going to be the driving force for bringing P4 medicine uh, to the healthcare community. I think physicians are way too conservative, and I think the healthcare community is kind of indifferent and certainly insurers, payers, and providers are only looking for how to minimize their uh, payout. So I think it's going to be patients that will drive this process, just as patients drove the process in AIDS for accepting triple drug therapy against very conservative physicians and against the very conservative uh, pharma industry and so forth. I think number two, we have to make sure all the data we generate in this new world is accessible for analysis. And the nightmare world of IRBs and the constraints it opposes on data 
is an enormous threat, I think in the US anyway, to our continuing leadership in this area because there are countries like China that have no constraints whatsoever and they will be able to use data uh, on a very large scale to mine for the predictive uh, medicine of the future. And the question of how we bring an understanding of P4 medicine to patients, uh, physicians, and the healthcare community is, I think, a major opportunity for IT and healthcare. And I don't see anybody stepping up to that. And then classic IT for healthcare, how do we deal with that? That is really interesting. So uh, Wired Magazine in 2007 created a movement called the Quantita uh, Quantified Self Movement. And it's a movement <coughs> in which today individuals use any combination of about 70 gadgets that digitize personalized information with regard to sleep, uh, ordinary parameters, uh, uh, blood pressure, weight, a variety of different kinds of things. And what is interesting about these, uh, these uh, social networks is their crowdsourcing. That is, people in these networks are really learning how to do these things effectively. And doing this yourself gives you enormous motivation to fundamentally change your lifestyles in really major ways. A friend of mine at San Diego runs the computing center down there. Larry Smarr has been doing this for 10 years. And he's absolutely a classic example of the problem patients run into with physicians. He started about six years ago measuring parameters that dealt with uh, the presence of inflammation in his body. And he noted that the C-reactive protein was 10 times above the normal level right at the very beginning. Got blown off by three successive physicians. Had an episode where he really got sick. They never really figured out was. It, it cleared spontaneously. Two more physicians blew him off and then he had an episode that put him in the hospital and it came close to killing him. Turned out he had inflammatory bowel disease, came very close to perforating a bowel. And you can imagine that a person like that doesn't trust most physicians. And that's going to be the kind of driving force that patient-activated social networks will provide. They will force their physicians to come to the table uh, and learn about the new kinds of opportunities. Um, so I'd say P4 medicine differs from evidence-based medicine in these uh, six areas. One, <coughs> it's proactive. Two, it's focused on the individual. Three, increasingly, it's going to be about wellness. Four, it's about generating enormous amounts of information so you can sculpt with exquisite sensitivity uh, optimization for the individual regarding wellness as opposed to disease. And five, it isn't going to generate large patient populations where you extract from the individual features and you make bell-shaped curves about the features. It's going to look at the individuals as units of biological activity, and it's going to use the individuals to aggregate those units into the stratification of patients by a whole series of different criteria relevant to whatever uh, disease and or drugs or whatever you need to talk about. This is the patient stratification I talked about uh, earlier. And patient-driven uh, patient social networks are really here. 23andMe has an enormous network of patients with Parkinson's disease, more than 8,000 now. Patients Like Me has many social networks around many different types of diseases. So it, uh, this is in process. P4 medicine then is about uh, quantizing wellness and about demystifying disease. And I would say it, it really has uh, five big societal implications. One is I think it's really going to turn around the sharply escalating costs of healthcare and bring it down to the point where we can export P4 medicine to the developing world. And think about a democratization of healthcare that was inconceivable uh, before. Number two, there's going to be a digitalization of medicine. 
and this is, will be an incredible revolution. We already see it in all these gadgets that can measure uh, so many self-parameters. This is going to be very much patient-driven, and it's all going to follow Morse laws, and these things are going to become cheaper and cheaper. One of the major factors is going to reduce at least the cost of uh, generating data for P4 medicine. I think it's going to force every single sector of the healthcare community to revise their business plans in the next 10 years in accordance with the new rules. And I think there are going to be a lot of dinosaurs out there that aren't going to be able to do it. And that's going to generate enormous opportunity for new sleek companies that are ideally fitted for the new opportunities and challenges of uh, P4 medicine. I would argue uh, for all the reasons this lecture has given so far, it's going to transform the practice of medicine. And I think P4 medicine is going to create, for those who adopt it, uh, enormous potential wealth. And I'll just give you one example in that regard. My conviction is in the next 10 to 15 years, there will emerge a wellness industry that will, be, that will far exceed the current healthcare industry. And it will be very, very much focused on uh, these, these early things that have to do with nutrition and changing behavior and digitalization of self-measurements and so forth. And we can already see companies beginning to emerge in this ilk. And I think the origins of the wellness industry will be utterly independent from those uh, for the disease industry, the so-called uh, healthcare industry. Why do I think P4 medicine will cost less, turn around the healthcare costs? One, early diagnosis is really going to revolutionize and lead to significant savings. The ability to stratify patients and disease and create a proper impedance match against uh, drugs is really critical. And let me give you just one example. Genentech developed a drug called Herceptin, which when initially tested, failed the tests completely. They developed a companion diagnostics and found 20% of the patients fell in a category that responded to this drug. They went to the FDA with 40 patients. They had 96% cure rate. They got the drug approved with 40 patients. Those are the kind of savings that one can think about in the future. Reengineering disease perturbed networks, that is new approaches to identifying drug targets. The benefits of wellness, I think, are obvious. Uh, the US society is estimated hundreds of billions of dollars are lost to disease every year. And of course, the digital technologies we talked about, digitalization of medicine is going to uh, at least uh, really knock down the cost of generating data. Sequencing is a great uh, example from you know, 2002 to 2012. Uh, the cost of sequencing DNA has come down 100,000 fold. And that gives you an idea of uh, an extremely hyper Morse law. And I think there'll be a lot of other advances. I think stem cell, I think neurodegeneration, aging vaccines, uh, cancer. I think all of those, we're going to see major breakthroughs uh, in the next 10 years or so. <coughs> the challenges for bringing P4 medicine to patients are two. One, technical. And that's all we've talked about to a first approximation. And the second is societal. And that, I think, is the, by far the bigger challenge. And it'll be the gating function which determines when a lot of the, P4, the aspects of P4 medicine uh, will be accepted. What uh, we've decided to do is develop strategic partnerships that can start bringing P4 medicine to patients now. And I'll just mention briefly two such partnerships that we've developed. So one is with the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg three and a half years ago. We came to a $100 million agreement over five years uh, to use that money to develop the strategies and tools of P4 medicine. And in return, we've done a lot of things for them. And I can talk about those if anyone is interested, including setting up and uh, Center for Systems Medicine at the University of Luxembourg. <coughs> so this has given us the resources to do a lot of the things I've talked about in this lecture. And number two, we created this P4 Medicine Institute, which together with IP ISP is creating this network of clinical centers uh, to develop these pilot projects that are fundamental proof principle projects. <coughs> 
And the first two members that have joined are Ohio State Medical School and Peace Health. And to give you an idea, here are the first six pilot projects we're talking in various combinations with various people about. And all of these projects have enormous opportunities for demonstrating the power of P4 medicine. So let me close with a couple of comments. One, come back to this slide I showed you earlier, where to show you how transformational systems medicine has already been with how we think about practicing health care. And I've gone through this whole list in some detail now, and I think you can begin to understand uh, it isn't going to happen in 10 years. It's happening now, and it will happen increasingly over the next 10 years, we will introduce these kinds of ideas into medicine. And the final uh, point that I would make is, I think what's, what's really interesting about um, the 21st century is for all scientific disciplines, the challenge is complexity. Biology has, and medicine have its own particular type of complexity. But what is unique about biology is we have these very powerful tools for dealing with our complexity very effectively. And I've talked about uh, most of these, except for the analytic tools in the context of this lecture. And I would argue, <coughs> if you think about what the major challenges that society faces are, healthcare, uh, global health, nutrition, energy, the environment, agriculture, uh, and so forth, all of these are amenable to exactly the same kind of systems-driven approaches that I've talked about here. And I think one of the key points for institutions that want to uh, attack these major problems from a systems point of view is to, again, develop this platform uh, that's systems-driven and cross-disciplinary and integrative and has all the features we've talked about. And I think one of the challenges, be it NYU in New York or NYU here, is how can you create that kind of environment that will drive the kind of process that we've talked about here. And to finish in even a more global sense, I would argue that systems approaches can be applied to many different disciplines, some in science and some outside of science. <coughs> and in fact, one I've thought a lot about that uh, I think is really fascinating is how you apply it to politics. And I think in some ways, Obama was one of the first systems politicians uh, and he did some things very well, and unfortunately, he did other things less well. But he, he is a, a model to think about a systems approach to politics. And my last slide is the Chinese symbol for the way. And I would argue uh, the way are these systems approaches, and they will let us attack both deep problems in biology and, and deep problems in life. Thank you very much. I managed to read the list of items you had to argue for the value of the Human Genome Project. Right. And this struck well, me. Well, good. You're, you're a very fast reader. Well, I got I'm to, impressed. to the point before last, and that one hit me because it was actually the same point that people who argue against the value of it exactly. use that point, which is the yeah. fact that it is not really one human. It's pieces of many humans. So it doesn't really tell you what a human is. Plus the fact that every gene has so many variants and alleles, it really doesn't tell us as much as we thought it does. So how do you? How well, do you but I was making a very different point there. Okay, so yeah, yeah, I understand your point. My point was there are no race-specific genes whatsoever. We all have the same genes. We have we we can have different variants in different races, but there aren't any race-specific genes. And fundamentally, to me, that says we are a single race. And if we differ in striking ways, it's almost certainly environmental and not genetic. So that was the only point I was making. You're making the point of life is really complicated, and I, I agree with that point as well. Yeah. In a healthcare system like in the US, who would you see paying for this P4 medicine? Just insurance industry, would they pay? For something like this, how pr would premium they're going to go sky high for people with what they can see as pre-existing conditions when 
when these tests become cheap? Well, I'll, t I'll tell you. So my attitude is, because the healthcare system in the US is so heterogeneous, I'm not really going to push the US to adopt P4 medicine. We're actually talking with a number of smaller countries now that have single healthcare systems that might be interested in bringing P4 in as a part of their healthcare system. But to answer their questions and to answer your question, I think what we can do in many cases is actually make economic arguments that will say to payers and providers that you really save a lot of money if you do it this way. And those arguments are going to be absolutely essential. So one part of what the P4 Medicine Institute is doing is creating a series of fellows that are going to look at, um, at societal questions. And one of the first ones we want to look at are specific economics of what, what you can argue for in terms of savings. So I don't think you're going to get anyone to change until you prove it's to their benefit to change. And I think we'll be able to do that. Insurance companies in the US will know they hit the jackpot. Well, no, they. They'll know they hit the jackpot. They will not be insuring anybody with, with certain results. Also, the ethical point. Well, well I, I think the really important point there is we have the beginning of a law, GINA, that protects against discrimination. And that law is going to be made much better. And I think before we do complete genome sequencing and things like that, that is an essential protection. I do agree with you yeah. completely. And yeah. the ethical part, you mentioned countries like China in terms of even pregnancies would be terminated if the kind of babies that are coming would have certain you know, results. That's, that's really, really dangerous for countries who don't have regulations and don't care about terminating pregnancies and Look, just having I certain think, uh, babies I, born. I, I agree with you completely. Look, any form of technology can be used in good ways or bad ways. So you can't say, let's paralyze technology because it can be used in a bad way. I think what we have to say is, let's make safeguards uh, to the extent we can so it isn't. But uh, so that's, uh, that's my point of view. You hit on my, my question a little bit with an answer to that. But I, w I was wondering what you felt in terms of uh, in, in ingrained American systems, there's often a, a fight against the new the new paradigm, as you, as you mentioned, obviously. Do you see uh, uh, legal and actually legislative challenges being put up by those currently in charge of the healthcare, healthcare system to your approach? You know, I don't see that. I mean, I see indifference and I see arrogance. I mean, I wrote, for example, a really beautiful paper to the Obama transition team four years ago that laid out P4 medicine and how it could really transform healthcare. And I never even got a response back. And I suspect that's because some of Obama's major scientific advisors come from the old guard. And they looked at this and kind of threw it away and said it wasn't worth responding to. So I don't think there'll be those kind of blocks. But I think the block of arrogant indifference is really it's a tough one to get around. And that's why we're going to be exploring the opportunities with some other countries. Because if it works really well in a small country, then the US is going to have to take it seriously. And if we've demonstrated it has the kind of cost savings. Look, I think in healthcare, what is really critical is one, improving health, but two, reducing the cost of healthcare. And unless you do both of those in parallel, you're, and, and no matter how good your technology is, it's not going to get by. Yeah. Uh, so my question is in regards to the second P in the uh, P4 medicine, preventative. Um, now, after um, the uh, after the technology that uh, you've developed uh, uh, recognizes or identifies a certain disease that might develop uh, over time. Uh, like, for example, certain diseases like uh, adenocarcinoma or leukemia. Um, how can you prevent those from, um, from uh, occurring in the future when, in the meantime right now, we don't have a permanent cure uh, for those certain diseases? So what would be, for example, the preventative protocol that you'd follow in order to uh, 
um, prevent those diseases from happening in the near or uh, far away future? So in the near future with cancer, I mean, we aren't going to be able to prevent it. It's a mutational disease. You don't know in which individuals that cascade of mutations is going to get started. So the best you can hope for in the near future is to be able to detect it very early and deal with it. And with many cancers, if you detect them early, you can, you can deal with them very efficiently. I think in the future, as we come to understand the factors that predispose people to cancer, we'll be able to read from the genomes probabilities about things you're going to have to worry about. And as we come to understand more deeply the mechanisms of initiation, you may be able to design drugs that prevent people from uh, going through that uh, difficulty. And, and for example, uh, women that, that uh, have uh, certain um, gene defects have very, very high percentage probability of getting cancer and all. So in those cases, maybe we can do really design preventive therapies that maybe even would start before the mutations began and so forth. But right now, all we'd be able to do is early, early detection and hopefully treating it more effectively. I really appreciate you sharing your vision, and I wholly um, believe in your vision. Um, have you heard of someone called John Milbanks? He's, um, he did it, I don't know anybody, somebody nodding their head down here. He, he's doing a global, um, you know, through the web, a worldwide mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. database for um, collection of uh, medical data. Um, the biggest obstacle to this uh, paradigm shift will be uh, economics, of course, and money. And, and the problem being that research companies who fund most research, and it sounds like you have an independent organization with the um, ABI, but it, they restrict data release. So fr scientists all over the world are very, very frustrated by the fact that, you know, even to uh, access another scientist's data <coughs> for the sake of looking at reducing disease globally, looking at cancer yeah. globally yeah. and so on. It's, it's the very, the biggest um, stumbling block, I think, to your vision. And that will probably delay it happening. But I think it has already started. And it it's has. not going to come from America, like you say. It's coming from all over the world. It will be centralized through specific people or organizations such as non-profiteering, you know, non I think. But I do think it will be held up, unfortunately, by the largest pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies and people who are providing the funding today? Well, you know, in the end, I don't know how serious that's going to be because the largest pharmaceutical companies are getting out of research now. They're really contracting out to academics, both for patients and, and for doing science. The other point I'd make is there is a nonprofit, and we're nonprofit, I just want to make that, and our policy is uh, open data, open software, and things like that. But there is a group in Seattle called SAGE, led by Steve Friend, and he is basically about open data, open access, and he's actually been able to persuade a number of big pharma to come together in pre-competitive groups and actually share data that they're supporting and things like that. So I think the... Um, the change is beginning, and I think what is going to be compelling for the skeptics is as this data, as these data really become available and they demonstrate the power of sharing and global access, I think, I think more and more people are going to become convinced that uh, restricting and hiding your data is not, not the way to go. Now, it, I mean, for me, the, 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 I think the thing that's most difficult for institutes like our own is, you know, we may spend, on the Prion project, we spent five years putting together an enormous data set, and we published it and made it all available, and then immediately you've got a gazillion bioinformatics people mining it in all these different ways. And, you know, we had some regret that we couldn't do it, but on the other hand, 
there's a lot of biology to do, and I'm utterly convinced it was the right thing to get it out there. So I see people becoming more and more, especially academics, more and more susceptible to openness. Frankly, the human genetics community is uh, a community that needs a bit of working on, too. There is an enormous possessiveness in some dimensions of that community. You mentioned that there are around 300 actionable variants that can be identified currently. But I would say that with the exception of breast cancer, many of these would be very rare conditions. Many of them we, are rare conditions. I agree with that. So if we look at a population level, <clears throat> it would contribute quite a small percentage of the total healthcare burden right now. So what are your recommendations for population level screening at the moment, both in terms of a cost perspective, but also looking at patient expectations? And you mentioned quite a little bit about um, patients, patient empowerment and patients taking control of their own medical data. But I think there's quite a big gray area at the moment with, with regards to um, genotyping data and the, how actionable that is if taken right. by right. clinicians. So, uh, I mean, it's true that uh, many of the variants are rare, but not all of them. I mean, there are the set of um, uh, enzymes that are involved in colon cancer, uh, mutations of which run in families and give it very f high incidence. And I would say that where we have identified family evidence of genetically inherited things, those families would be the ideal ones to screen so they could know whether they're going to have to uh, have repeated colostomies to keep track of what's going on. So there will be things that will be really useful. Uh, Leiden fa Leiden factor 5 is an example of, uh, of blood clotting difficulty, and it can really make a difference to people who fly or not uh, to know whether you have that or not. I had a good friend that almost died because he was heterozygous for that defect, and they took him straight from a plane to a hospital, and it took him two months to recover. So, you know, the, the, there aren't a lot of these things, but there are enough that I think they'll be very useful. But I think the really important point isn't to do, at this point, population screening, except in rare cases. I think it would be useful for all of us to know whether we had any one of those 300 variants and what we should do about it. And I don't see how anybody could argue against that. And the variant implies you can do something that will increase your, your uh, wellness, like my, my friend at Microsoft. So, so I think that I agree that targeted screening is of huge interest, but I think from a cost perspective, po whole population screening might not be cost effective right now. Yeah, that's true. I, I will say the way things are changing I think in five years, cost screening of DNA kinds of things is going to be really, really inexpensive. We'll be able to do very large scale things very, very easily. But uh, I think we want to do it in a way that's rational and makes sense and focus on higher probability possibilities. But again, in five years, maybe there'll be a thousand actionable genes. And that's even going to be a more compelling reason to have your genome done so you can have it checked annually. There was recent studies that have suggested that uh, the age of parents at conception uh, has an influence on passing the number of mutations off onto offspring. Do your studies confirm that? We've not done studies relevant to that really interesting observation. Uh, so it says fathers can be much more guilty than mothers can on certain kinds of things then, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, those are very interesting data, but we don't have anything to speak to that. Thank you. Um, also, you made me think about when you mentioned about paradigm shifts in biology. Do your mathematical models use a Gaussian distribution, standard distribution? Uh, most of the models that we've done to date are derived from network dynamics, and they don't use uh, those kinds of models. OK, and finally, uh, you mentioned society must access patient data and make it available to biologists for pioneering predictive medicine of the future. Just, I know that obviously being a, a, a head of a very big institution, you see the big picture. I just want to know what you feel about patient autonomy 
and rights of uh, ownership of data and uh, protection in terms of breach of patient security, in terms of data? Well, look, I think security is really critical, no question. I think proper protection of patients against exploitation from employers and insurance companies, I think uh, those, are, uh, those are all critical points. But I will say with regard to patients' data, frankly, it's society that's generated the tools, the ability to look at those data, and it's society, including the patient's children and grandchildren that stand to benefit from making that data available. So I have really strong feelings that I think society should own the data and not the patient. Now, I have a lawyer who's head of the P4 Medicine Institute who thinks that position is utterly crazy. But, uh, but uh, I mean, those data are key to the medicine of the future and to think that individuals can have the right collectively to withhold it, I think is, is really, <coughs> would really be unfortunate for society. And frankly, <clears throat> all it would mean is all of these things would be developed in China way, way before they'd be developed in the US because China has no such constraints whatsoever, let me tell you. You talked a lot about the uh, tremendous opportunities that may become available with uh, all the new data. And I'm just curious with, um, about the role of bioinformatics and if you could comment more about some of those computational softwares because we know that sequencing prices will come down or already have a lot. But we've heard a lot about how the bottleneck is going to be with what to do with all that data. So how do you see the evolution with bioinformatics coming over the next couple of years? <coughs> Well, let me just say that somewhere between a quarter and a third of the people at the Institute fall in the software engineer, computer science, theoretical physics, uh, engineering side that do data modeling and things like this. And I think that what is really critical in developing the software we need to interpret the human genome or anything else is that that software is driven by biology. It's not driven abstractly by people who think they know what we need. So my feeling is what's really critical, and, and as an example, look at that beautiful pipeline of software we've developed for family genome sequencing. That really is an incredibly powerful integrated tool for doing things. So I think what's really important is institutions such as yourself recognize the importance of the bioinformatics and software and create an environment where uh, you too can drive the tools. I think the key is they aren't going to be done by companies. Companies will take what academics do and optimize things, but in general they don't put in uh, the front end work that's necessary for a lot of, of uh, sophisticated software programs and things like that, unless there's immediate uh, commercial value that's uh, that's obvious and everything. So I think it's really up to us to generate those tools and to make those tools freely accessible to others so they can improve them and optimize them uh, as they will. <laughs>